G'day, Justin Hong from Right Source here talking governance and board culture. So this is the last of four um, sessions I've done where we've talked about uh, board culture and how governance and understanding governance and the tools that it has can help you affect the culture of your organization and affect the culture at the board level. Just as a quick intro, like culture is a very elusive thing, um, but something that I think is now pretty well established that it is a high importance for the board to be aware of and to be managing, actively managing to make sure that's the culture they want in the organization. But it comes with these challenges because culture is extremely elusive and it's hard to grasp it and see it and know what it is. So with culture being effectively a makeup of beliefs and behaviors and how people interact, it is always hard to, to measure it and then say, well, this is this is what it is, so let's. this is how we need it to look. What I'm trying to do with um, these sessions is really talk through a couple of aspects in terms of how you can look at culture, look at some governance tools that are available to every organization, and how they might allow you to affect the culture in a way that you want it to, to move forward. So today we've talked through motivation of people um, coming to a board, uh, legacy, which is a very interesting board topic, uh, and setting expectations. So they're the three that we've done today. I'll we'll talk about teamwork. A board is a team and any effective team um, is really important and really valuable because simplistically, the worst decision a team should have would be the best decision of the best individual on the team. So that means a team is able to really leverage off those who are working within their team and come up with ideas that would be much better than any of them individually could. And that's what you want. That's what you want in a board. You want a great performing team. So how, how do you do that? For me, one of the most important parts of a team is diversity and inclusion. So we hear diversity talked about a lot and I'll, that, that's the first thing I wanna talk about. And for, what, for me, what diversity brings to an organization, absolutely having a, a, your policies in place to say, you know, what you want in terms of the diversity in your organization is a great cultural evidence point. It helps behaviors. Um, it also helps eliminate bias. So you will have bias within any organization. So having policies or procedures that help ensure there's a level of diversity in the organization that you're after definitely helps the cultural aspect. What diversity brings to a team is your diversity of thought. So if you have people coming at problems from different angles, you're more likely to find a solution. Whereas everyone's coming from the same history, the same beliefs, you pro and you get stuck, you're less likely to find a solution. So diversity of thought is very important from a team. So those policies then come through to a, at a board level, getting diversity at your board level, your diversity of thought. And that's really important. And again, seeing that and evidencing that at a board level will help the whole organization take that on as a belief and as a behavior and how they should interact and how they should work as an organization. So that's a, in itself, is a very important cultural aspect. The challenge with diversity is the diversity hires, where people are hired because of the diversity or brought onto a board because of their diversity, but then they don't really contribute. So you've ticked the diversity box, but you actually haven't you're not getting their input, you're not getting the diversity of thought, you're not really getting the value that they're bringing. So the important part of diversity, or the part that goes with it, is inclusion. What inclusion is, is really about creating an environment that allows people to be able to communicate and communicate effectively. When you're brought onto any organization, any position, if you feel you've just been brought there because of your diversity, but you're not listened to, it can actually create more damage than good. So you want that inclusion to happen. Now, how, do you, how does that happen? One of the most important things for inclusion is a shared language. So you want people to be able to understand how they communicate with each other and what is the appropriate way to communicate. This is where a lot of your governance processes can come in in terms of providing a clear pathway for communication. So, and I mean, these are policies to a fair extent. So what is, you know, one of the great way to evidence this I've seen in organizations is when people try and bring in a safety culture. How do you do that? Well, you start doing training, you do procedures, you do policies, you start using language 
that people can use generically regardless of their position because that cultural aspect, that safety aspect is what's important. So we want to talk about safety. Well, you can then talk to, to safety about anyone in the organization. So it would, it encourages, if done correctly, it encourages, you know, the lowest level and the hierarchy to be able to talk to the, the highest level, but be able to talk at the same way with the same language, irrespective of their position. So it takes away the authoritarian part of the organization. So it works from a safety point of view. If you, it works from a risk point of view. So this is where having risk appetite statements done and a risk management framework is, this is where it hits the road for an organization. Because if you can talk across the organization in a consistent way about risk, all of a sudden you're sharing a language, you're sharing a shared belief, a shared behavior. This is what drives culture. When you take that through anything that you're doing in terms of setting vision and in terms of values, that's what it's, it's allowing you to do, saying, well, these are our values. This is how we should act. So that if someone's doing not following that, you can talk to them, but you can talk to them about, well, this is what we've all agreed, as opposed to making it personal, and it facilitates the conversation. Because it facilitates conversation, that language then permeates the organization. So by setting these things and starting them up as a, at a board level, it allows you to control the language that's used in the organization, allows you to influence that, and that then influences the culture that you create. So this is where, you know, at a board level, and we're talking about risk appetite, and some people go, oh, I don't understand why we do this. Part of it is to set the culture. Well, what, what risks do you want? What behaviors do you want in the organization? And if people aren't following those behaviors, how do you guide them to move towards the behaviors you want? Well, this is that, that evidence, the, and it's, it is policy, it is writing these things down so that they're there and able to be used as those guideposts. So that's where teamwork, to me, really is lifted by diversity, but pairing that with inclusion. So having that diversity, but making sure that that is real and it's an inclusive use of di diversity. And that is where governance and having the processes in place can really affect the culture of your organization and affect the culture at a board level. That's uh, our topic for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I really enjoy learning and diving into the cultural aspects. So always happy to answer any questions you might have if you are interested in more topics similar to this, check out our YouTube channel. We've got a whole heap of uh, not-for-profit and governance videos similar to this, plus the other three that we did in relation to board culture. So definitely check those out. Otherwise, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. It's Justin Hogg from RightSource.